Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, my name is Noel Clehan and welcome to the uh, seventh episode of A Closer Look, uh, an Asia Society Switzerland series. Today we will look at the Philippines. I'm the Global Head of Regulatory and Public Policy at BDO, uh, a global professional services organization. Um, and this series is sponsored by uh, BDO and by the uh, Institute of Asian and Oriental Studies at the University of Zurich. And we hope to shed light on different Asian countries through the eyes of leading local voices. So a little background on the fascinating country that we're looking at today. Uh, the Philippines consists of more than 7,000 islands and islets, uh, but the bulk of its fast growing population uh, lives on just 11 of those islands. The capital Manila and its largest city, Quezon City, are in the northern island of Luzon. Uh, and the ethnically diverse people of the Philippines as you can imagine, called Filipinos. Uh, majority are of Malay descent and come from Southeast Asia and from what is now called Indonesia. Contemporary Filipino society consists of nearly uh, 100 culturally and linguistically distinct ethnic groups and is believed that there are over uh, 150 languages spoken in uh, the Philippines. The national language, uh, Filipino or Filipino, uh, is based on Tagalog and shares a place with English uh, as the official language and medium of instruction in Philippine schools. Some 80% of the population profess to be Roman Catholic and approximately 5% of the population mostly concentrated in the Southern Islands are uh, Filipino Muslims, uh, collectively known as Moros. Uh, the Philippines ranks, as you'll see uh, on, the, on screen, uh, 107th out of 186 countries in terms of the Human Development Index, a measure generated by the UN. Um, which captures uh, details of lifespan, education standards, and gross national income. Uh, the Philippines occupies the same spot as Indonesia in this index. And while Indonesia has a higher gross national uh, income per capita, the Philippines actually scores uh, higher on uh, the mean number of years of schooling. Uh, much of the country is mountainous and prone to earthquakes. It's often buffeted by typhoons and other storms. And although volcanoes are a conspicuous uh, feature of the landscape, there is relatively little volcanic activity. Uh, the Philippines are rich in resources and have the potential to build a really strong industrial economy. Uh, but for now, the country remains largely agricultural. Towards the end of the 20th century, rapid industrial expansion was spurred by a high degree of domestic and foreign investment. Uh, however, that growth uh, simultaneously contributed to severe degradation of the environment in some parts. Looking at those pictures, I can certainly relate to the one in the middle. I've sat in a taxi in that uh, traffic on a number of occasions. The Philippines also emerged as a regional leader in education, uh, harking back to the uh, HDI index, in education during the, uh, the, the late 20th century, uh, with a well-established public school and university system. And in the early 21st century, the country had one of the highest literacy rates in Asia. According to the World Bank, the Philippines is on its way to becoming an upper middle income country in the next few years, with a capital a GDP per capita of in excess of 3,300 US dollars, lower than Indonesia's, but higher than its neighbor, Vietnam. It has a huge diaspora. Uh, numbers differ as to how many Filipinos live abroad, uh, but it's established that it's it, the remittances from that diaspora represent as much as nine, maybe even 10% of the country's GDP, making uh, the Philippines Asia's largest recipient of remittances after India and China, which of course have significantly larger populations. To the history, insofar as you can cover the history of any country in one slide, Here's a snapshot. Uh, the Philippines, named after the 16th century uh, Spanish King Philip, was a Spanish colony for more than 300 years, but was ceded to the US in 1898 following, following the Spanish-American War. Um, Spanish and US influences remain strong, however, especially in terms of language, religion, and government. The Philippines gained full independence itself in 1946 uh, and adopted a US-style constitution. The last quarter century, uh, uh, the last quarter of the 20th century, rather, was a period of political turmoil uh, after more than a decade of authoritarian rule under President Ferdinand Marcos and the People Power Movement uh, in 1986, in fact, exactly 36 weeks ago this week, drove Marcos from power 
and restored democratic government to the Philippines. The country has struggled with persistent ethno-linguistic divides and Islamist and communist movements in the southern islands, uh, which are uh, among the longest running insurgencies in the world. And uh, the man you see on, sc on screen, uh, the current president, Rodrigo Duterte, um, was elected in 2016 uh, for uh, only one term is permissible under uh, Philippine law, and he is uh, stepping down in May. Uh, he's been considered a human rights, or certainly his drugs policies have been considered a human rights abomination by many observers abroad, um, but has apparently enjoyed wide domestic support in the Philippines. And it is probably expected to go down as his signature policy uh, of his presidency. So uh, that's the Philippines in a snapshot uh, to our excellent and interesting panelists. Manuel Quezon III uh, has served as a speechwriter and a writing consultant to two presidents of the Philippines and for a number of other public figures. Manuel, uh, besides being a political and a crisis communications specialist, is also a historian and a lecturer uh, in journalism and has worked in both government and in the private sector. So welcome, Manuel. And if I can ask you uh, to put on your camera shortly. Um, Mina Roches is a professor of history at the University of New South Wales in Sydney, Australia. She's the author of four books, uh, a co-editor of several anthologies on the topic of women in Asia, and her research interests primarily lie in 20th century Philippine history, particularly women's history, as well as the history of dress. Her latest book, The Filipino Migration Experience, Global Agents of Change, uh, came out last October, so we're happy to plug that for you, Mina. And Mina uh, moved to Australia with her family in 1977, but has maintained close contact with her homeland ever since. So, Mina and Manuel, Please switch on your cameras. Here we are. Lovely to see you. Well, I hope I did you justice and your country justice yes, in thank you. terms of the um, of the introduction. Uh, you know, it's very difficult to capture all the history, geography, and uh, aspects of any country in a few minutes. Uh, but just to warm both of you up and maybe our online audience, uh, Mina, can I put you a very quick question? Uh, where do you see the Philippine strengths? Uh, what fascinates you most about the Philippines? What concerns you most about it? A lot of questions in there, but as quickly as you can, warm us yes. up. Uh, Filipinos are very resilient people, so they can cope with many annual typhoons and global challenges of the economy. Uh, they were willing to live overseas, separated from their families to make ends meet. So they're very resilient and very resourceful. There are lots of activists. They're very organized with the activist movement. What fascinates me, uh, so that's what I see as the strength. Uh, what fascinates me is because it's a country that has a lot of contradictions and complexities. So, for example, the Philippines is the only Asian country to have made it to the top 10 in the 2018 Global Gender Gap Report, meaning it's one of the best countries in the world in terms of gender equality already achieved, but it's also just one of just two or three countries in the world where absolute divorce is not legally possible. It's also a country which has mentioned almost every Filipino uh, has a relative abroad so that in, in our family reunion, my brother-in-law, who's white Australian, asked me once, is there a city in the world where you do not have a relative? So, I mean, that's uh, the experience of all Filipinos. What concerns me most is connected to that answer. There, with so many Filipinos leaving the country, and these are the uh, highly skilled, um, uh, work, those who work very hard and who are quite determined, there's a brain drain, and so the, cousin, uh, the country loses a lot of skilled people. I also think poverty and unemployment and the fact that there's no f free health care is a problem. And I will leave Manuel to talk about politics. <laughs> <laughs> Manuel, follow that. If you only had a few words, how, how would you judge the current state of the country uh, across the headings of maybe society, politics, economy? The, the quick and nasty answer, and we'll get into well, the details later. I, I, I think it's uh, another academic, a uh, fellow columnist of mine has, uh, has identified it simply as we're undergoing a crisis of modernity. The Philippines is a very traditional uh, society, uh, but the very the different factors that Mina pointed out means we are perpetually confronting what it means to live in an increasingly modern world with modern institutions and methods, and yet we stick to our pre-modern ways of thinking and dealing with each other. That's an interesting phrase, crisis of modernity. Let's come back to that later on. Um, Mina, what's the biggest misconception people have uh, about the Philippines? 
Um, coming from Australia, I can talk about the Australian one more clearly. Uh, they have a stereotype, Australians have a stereotype of Filipino women, and I hate that. It's an orientalist that we're demure and obedient and sexy and sensual, and you, you get this, you know, somebody who'll cook three meals a day for you and be a hotbed in bed. Uh, and But actually, uh, Filipino women actually hold the purse strings and handle the family budget, and they're very highly educated. So when a, a white Australian male uh, is very fond of marrying Filipino women. In the 1980s, there was a, if you look at Filipino migration to Australia, the women outnumber, the Filipino women outnumber men. Uh, and and uh, they all have higher educational, women have higher, Filipino women have higher educational qualifications than their white Australian husband. So I think the, the stereotype is that, you know, Filipinos are, women are not highly educated and and uh, are you know demure and uh, it's, it's, a, it's a real fantasy and and it's actually a dangerous uh, stereotype because in the 80s and 90s Filipino women in Australia wives of white Australian men were overrepresented as victims of domestic violence so you see and and it's been traced to the fact that they have this terrible misrepresentation of women that's just wrong so I I'll, see. I'll, I'll that's fine. That. Yes. Yeah. Ma mm -hmm. Manuel, uh, keeping it moving quickly along, where, where do you see your country uh, when comparing it to the neighboring countries of, of uh, Vietnam and Malaysia and Indonesia, for example? Well, you know, the, the dilemma is this. Um, as an Indonesian friend has pointed out, many of the middle and upper middle managers uh, in the region are Filipinos. So we are, we are keeping things humming along, but we seem and we're perpetually criticizing ourselves for being unable to manage ourselves. Um, and again, this, this brings me back to this whole crisis of modernity. We have many of the surface appearances of being a very progressive and up-to-date society and place. We love all the fashionable things, but in terms of actually uh, doing the nitty-gritty, the, the background works of, of functioning systems, uh, that is where we seem to come short and where we are perpetually uh, jealous of our neighbors, Singapore to be precise. That's very interesting. And we'll probably come to it later on when we talk about uh, President Duterte's uh, manifesto when he was elected and, and the things he sought and was intending to change. And of course, whether uh, he was successful in that or not. Um, in terms of the one thing that people should know about you to better understand uh, your perspective on your home country, and this is on you personally, Mina, what should we know about you that would give us a, an insight into you and uh, how you view your home country, the Philippines? Okay, I am what social scientists label a 1.5 migrant, somebody who left the Philippines as a teenager, 17. Uh, the, the cultural construction of the ideal women in the Philippines is wife and mother. I have never married and I'm not a mother. So some of my relatives and former high school classmates see me as kawawa, which in Tagalog means a pitiful person because I fail, failed to fulfill this gender ideal. And this has influenced me or inspired me into writing about women's movements in the Philippines. So I write about that and how activists try to change this. Uh, in Australia, of course, uh, uh, there is no negative uh, um, capital assigned to women who haven't been married. Uh, so I've so, and also, I, as a migrant, I thought I could write a book on migration from the migrant's perspective. It's very interesting. When I was doing my PhD and I came back to the Philippines for research, all my relatives were wringing their hands saying, why are you doing a doctorate and, and lessening your chances of ever finding a man? So I wow. think this has probably influenced me to become a feminist historian. So that's something about me. Wow, it's a country of, of contradictions, so progressive in many ways and, and so yes. conservative in others. Yeah, Manuel, the same question to you. Tell us about, well, something about you to give us an insight into you. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm a lib liberal Democrat in a country that has swung to the hard right and a journalist and specifically a newspaper person in an industry that is slowly uh, dying in the age of social media. So I'm in many ways, I feel like I'm one of the last dodos. Dodos. Yes. <laughs> right. Say that phrase again. You were a, a liberal in a society. Liberal of... Democrat in a society that is turning to the right and a journalist, specifically a newspaper person in a society that is embracing social media instead. Very good. And you have a famous name. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that? that, that yes. Well, my grandfather was uh, the first uh, nationally elected president, and therefore that uh, intimately connects me in many ways to our society and its political 
uh, institutions. Very good. Well, thank you both. I think that gives our audience uh, a good insight into who we have as our panellists today. Uh, well qualified, to say the least, to, to uh, uh, raise our levels of awareness of, of your fascinating home country. Uh, starting with a question for, for yourself, Mina. Um, the country is only recently becoming comfortable with its own identity, uh, as both of you have alluded to in your introductory remarks. It's rigid allegedly male-dominated class structure uh, and her prohibition of on divorce uh, are, are some aspects of it. But also the country has been considered very progressive in other areas um, by comparison to other countries in the region in particular. F- from a distance, do you, v- do you view the Filipino uh, identity now as um, conservative, progressive, liberal, contradictory? Talk to us about the identity, the gender identity, the social mores, etc. Ah, well, I was going to approach it from the way Philippine identity is imagined, and it changes over time. So in the 1950s, the public intellectuals uh, debated on what is the Filipino. They just got independence. What is, And so some people, uh, literature wrote that it, was, it resided in the masses, the common people and not the elites. Nick Joaquin, the national artist for literature, said, no, you need to carry our Spanish heritage. It's part of us, and we should carry it within us as we go on. And in the 1970s and 80s, there was a move to have Tagalog, the national language, and when I was going to high school, we had to learn Philippine history in Tagalog. Uh, and that was kind of a radical thing at the time. So uh, then so then the re- identity resided in the common people and the masses in Tagalog. And then in the 90s, when the Philippines celebrated the centennial of independence from Spain, uh, then there was a harking back to, uh, you look at the houses that they wanted to reconstruct the houses and domestic interiors to look like the 19th century Europeanized elite. Uh, or else they're going to have a vet- more recently now since after the 21st century, they want to have some tribal art in their house. So the elite Filipinos want to pay homage to indigenous Filipinos in the 19th century elite. But if you look at the, the migrants all over the world, you know, it, if you're going to debate what's a Filipino identity, there's if 10% in every single Filipino family is a migrant abroad, you can't say they're not Filipino anymore. There was a time when they said people like us who left were traitors, but that's reversed because as, you, as Noel, you just said that they're saving the economy with their pittances. So now popular culture is sort of celebrating it. And Filipino, being Filipino is a shared living experience. Uh, uh, and so, for example, there are jokes, uh, jokes books and, that are published, like, how do you know you're Filipino? Mannerisms and personality traits. And they're humorous. Do you point with your mouth? With your lips? Uh, do, you cons- do you smile for no reason? You notice I smile a lot. Uh, do you consistently arrive 30 minutes late for every event? And do you say comfort room instead of bathroom? Uh, this is funny. And if you score over 259, you're told there's no doubt what your ethnic identity is. You are Filipino. If you score below 172, you have OFT, obvious Filipino tendencies. Go with the flow to reach full <laughs> Filipino potential. Prepare for assimilation because resistance is futile. Yeah. So the real message, according to scholars John Seidel and Eva Lotta Hedman, is that Filipino identity should be seen shared and savored through a light, affectionate, self-deprecatory joke, a joke that perhaps only other Filipinos can appreciate. So if all of you in the audience got these jokes, then you all have OFT, uh, obvious Filipino tendency, so prepare for assimilation because resistance is futile. Thank you very much. Well, I can tell you being Irish, though I live in Belgium, um, the, the Irish healthcare system and possibly the Belgian one would collapse without uh, Filipina and Filipino nurses and doctors throughout yeah. the system. So we're very glad of you in Europe. Um, I mean, just talking about the, the history, uh, how has the dominant role of the Catholic Church shaped society in the country? Uh, and I leave that one with you, Mina, for the moment. Uh, um, the Catholic, Catholic Church, oh well, has a very big role on gender norms. I'm looking at it as a gender historian. So there's uh, uh, no divorce and reproductive rights, although the bill has passed, it hasn't been enforced. Uh, um, nuns and priests are very, very high uh, symbolic capital and status in the Philippines. They have moral power. Many educational institutions are run by Catholic orders, so they have an impact in shaping people's thinking. Uh, my high school classmates, we were told to raise a million for the poor in one reunion, and my classmates said, shouldn't they all give us a million pesos for the therapy we have to go from the brainwashing of, of the uh, Catholic education? So gender ideals, the Virgin Mary is the ideal woman. It's the suffering mother, the Mater de la Rosa. Uh, and so women are pressured to sacrifice everything for their children. Uh, uh, women must be chased wives and obedient daughters. Uh, and this is carried away 
all, all to the diaspora when they have their coming of age ceremonies abroad. Uh, we also have feminist nuns. You don't think many nuns can be feminists. My colleagues laughed at me when they found out I wrote an article about uh, Filipino feminist nuns. But, femin but uh, nuns in the Philippines have been crucial to feminists theorizing, analyzing the religious roots of women's oppression. So they wanted to demythologize suffering to tell women that they don't have to suffer. They don't have to put up with things uh, since uh, they also were told to replace Mary the suffering mother with Mary the apostle and since post Vatican II invited religious to live with the poor the chair of the Gabriela the most well-known feminist organization was chaired by and a Benedictine nun sister Mary John Manansan uh, and feminist nuns founded NGOs for prostituted women they worked with factory women export processing zones and urban poor so that's that's you see the the, the good side right. of the church also try and balance within with the uh, power of the church yeah in terms of gender uh, in our preparatory call last week you mentioned to me that uh, women are often typically the financial managers in a household yes. and, and are often successful in politics and business as well uh, and that the, as you just pointed out there is a robust women's movement yes. uh, but but um Men have many girlfriends, uh, or it's yes. not uncommon, uh, but it's it's not uh, acceptable to have for women to have many boyfriends. No, it's say. not. Wow, yes. it's, it is a. It's 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 one of the gender contradictions. Uh, men yeah. are imagined to be naturally lustful. It's not just the Philippines. This imagination that men must be naturally lustful, lustful is a Southeast Asia thing. You'll find the same thing in Indonesia and Thailand. Uh, um, so men with mistresses. Uh, can are seen to be sexually virile and are therefore very uh, high status because they have the money they can have uh, and and women are not imagined to have any sexual desire so they think why does a man have a mistress she must be doing it because he's buying her a condominium uh, so the uh, th that would be the the idea uh, uh, on the other hand it doesn't work for so a politician with lots of mistresses that the bill clinton uh, drama with monica Lewinsky, if that happened in the philippines it would not have affected the persons uh, uh, the unless a of course, he was giving corrupt money to the mistress and that, that they would draw the line there. On the other hand, the women can't. Women are not supposed, men are supposed to be chased. So give you a recent example, Professor, President Duterte hoped to hum humiliate his loudest critic, Senator Laila de Lima, and intimidate her into silence by threatening, threatening to disseminate an alleged tape of the senator having sex with her driver with whom she was allegedly having an affair. Now, she was separated from her husband, so technically not uh, committing adultery, but the very suggestion that the single woman was having sex with a man who was not her husband was supposed to expose her to be untrustworthy. So, you know, women's uh, sexual purity is connected to their morality in, in this particular case. And it was considered even more, quote unquote, shameful that she was having sex with someone of a lower class status than herself. But if a man did it, he would have a status and there would be no no shame in it. Wow, so interesting. Kind of interesting. <laughs> I, I won't probe too deeply into them. Uh, I'll be the diplomatic moderator and, and move on to Manuel. Yes. Uh, on the political side, Manuel, uh, the Philippines is also the only country uh, in the world, as I understand it, with an LGBT political party, uh, which I think is called Lad Lad. Is that correct? Um, how does it do in elections? And is it a, is it a nationwide party or, or is it only found in maybe the major urban conurbation? Well, it's a, I guess the safest way to describe it would be an urban party of, of, of uh, hardly any success, but great uh, abilities to, to, to obtain coverage in the media. Um, like, like so many things, um, I, I once attended a conference in Indonesia where the, the sort of universal problem we had in our, have in our part of the world is that uh, the, our urban centers are in the 21st century while large parts of the country are still in the 19th. And this applies to, to attitudes, this applies to the uh, participation of, of civic civil society um, and, and its presence. So we have a very vigorous civil society, but one that is in, in many ways uh, kept in a kind of a, a circumvented area where, they, where it can participate politically, but in many ways is uh, not not so so effective uh, nationally. We have a system called the party list system, which is a bit different from what you're used to in Europe, uh, which per, which allows a sort of token representation of different marginal groups in our legislature. But over time, and, and this is something Filipinos pride themselves on, we are very good at finding the loopholes to things. So what began as a way of establishing a preferential option for marginalized groups 
to bring them into our political life has now been overtaken by basically the American term of fandoms, uh, regional groups, family groups, groups of fans of particular TV shows. Um, mm. And these um, over time have been given uh, as equal legitimate uh, representation in this system. Um, so much so that now the whole the whole system of party list representation has become quite controversial. Yeah, just in terms of some of what you said there, um, we, we touched earlier on the Spanish and US uh, colonial heritage and history of the country um, and feelings about both the US and Spain and apparently also China are, are somewhat mixed among the Filipino population. Uh, and there's definitely been a shift in recent years, uh, at least at the political level, a, a, away from the US. Um, in what ways have the two former colonial powers shaped life and politics uh, in the Philippines? And are those influences still playing a part? And I recognize that the Spanish influence, of course, uh, uh, officially ceased in 1898. So that's some time ago. But uh, to what extent are, are, are the uh, two uh, colonial powers still an influence in Philippine life, Manuel? I think I think you could measure it. And the influence of Spain remains in terms of three things, food, uh, uh, fashion, particularly what is considered beautiful, uh, and of course in religion because of the Catholic Church, which is um, extremely uh, the Spanish kind of Catholicism, which is a uh, particular kind. Um, you can see that, for example, in terms of beauty, the Filipino um, obsession with whiteness um, as a symbol of, of what is beautiful uh, began to give way in the 1990s to an, to an orientation uh, like so much of the region towards uh, Eastern Asia. So now it is, um, it is Korea and Japan and even China that are now the objects of, of, of beauty. And also at the same time, a greater acceptance of, of blackness, which formerly was completely taboo because of, this, of Spain and the United States. In terms of the United States, we are culturally... Um, very much still oriented uh, towards the United States, also because of language. So that has a profound effect on our academic and uh, and our literature and our thinking, and of course, in our political institutions. But again, we are residents of a particular part of the world, which is finding uh, the United States receding in terms of its commitment and, and influence, and where China is returning to its uh, status of prominence and centrality uh, from 200 years ago. Um, how we are navigating that is 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 a, a very interesting. Um, I think you're seeing it in the adoption, first of all, of, of big portions of our society of uh, Chineseness as uh, the the mark of prestige and sophistication, where formerly that would have been measured by your being cosmopolitan in a Western uh, manner. Um, so so you're you're beginning to see that. But the 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 for example, our government's orientation towards Beijing was vetoed in many ways by the public's continued embracing of the United States and our alliance with America. Okay, and is that still the case at the people level, even if the government has, uh, yes. has taken an ambivalent so that, approach? Yes, we are. We are a society where public opinions uh, plays a role that many ways transcends institutions, mm -hmm. and um, even the most strong-armed leaders uh, are very sensitive to public opinion, and that showed the limits of of, of the official engagement with China, for example. Okay, I suppose one of the other obvious influences is likely to be the diaspora. Uh, we, we haven't yes. yet been able to get a number that we can settle on as to how many Filipinos are abroad, but the uh, the Philippine Statistics uh, Agency suggests that the, uh, the contribution to GDP of remittances is in, in around the 9 or 10%. Uh, aside from the monetary... It's very country, interesting. Yeah, go mm -hmm. ahead. Go ahead. It's very interesting because um, the diaspora has particularly made the Philippine economy uh, impervious to whatever uh, any sitting administration can really set out to do. So in many ways, it has given a kind of stability um, because it's it's the best kind. It's a fiscal stability because of the constant inflows of of, of remittances. It also points to um, you were you were mentioning how our official statistics can't keep up with the diaspora because the Philippine um, a, a Frenchman once told me, you know, you you are uh, you 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 aren't you aren't like the French. We mention, we we measure our identity by the land. 
but you are like the Germans. You measure it by blood. And so therefore, this, the even minor admixtures will make you part of the, the Filipino expanding uh, sense of identity. Um, we measure it also in terms of our, our ability to influence those with whom we're mixing. So the joke goes that there is an entire generation of Italians who are being raised by Filipino nannies to enjoy what older Italians consider to be the Filipino abomination of sweet spaghetti with hot dog bits, which we all love, which drives everyone crazy. And we are absolutely convinced is 25 years away from being a new national dish in Italy. It sounds tasty, uh, but if not quite good <laughs> cuisine. N- Mina, you are one of the diaspora. Um, yes. F- from a distance in Australia, do you sense that uh, the diaspora uh, shapes the um, the motherland, as it were, the Philippines? Oh, yes. So, um, as I argued in my book, there are agents of change. It's had a big impact, and not just in remittances. Uh, they have power as consumers. People like to imagine Filipinos as laboring abroad, but consumption is just as important as earning a living. When they translate the money from euros into Filipino pesos, it's a lot. So you can go to an hour and a half from Manila in Laguna, a place called, uh, called Santa Rosa, where all the houses look like Italian villas, which they copied from their employers. Uh, the real estate boom is attributed. The, con- the, the fact that Filipino domestic workers in Singapore are addicted to Tagalog uh, Filipino romance novels is, has made that a, a, a boom in the publishing industry. Uh, the subscriptions to the Filipino channel, Filipino cable, is 40% of the revenue of ABS-CBN Channel 2. And because Filipinos keep sending gifts from overseas back home, all the courier businesses are doing well. Uh, Overseas here is a Filipino-Australian Medical Association, also in America, they have equivalent. They go to the Philippines on their annual leave once a year to give free medical care to the poor in every remote city in the Philippines. So diasporic philanthropy, medical aid, the Philippine International Aid in San Francisco, uh, give scholarships to street children. So if I notice going back, I go to the Philippines every year, I notice there are less, fewer and fewer street children. And uh, I, I was led to this organization, San Francisco, where they have uh, put 38,000 street children through school, spending 3 million US dollars in the last 20 years. So uh, I think they have changed the homeland. You could see that. And politics. Uh, I noticed yes. that the mayor of Batangas, one of the towns in Batangas, campaigns in Italy. Because now that there's an overseas suffrage vote, they, it's funny that he, could, he oh, will wow. campaign in Italy okay. for to win in a, as a mayor of a town there. When they come back, as, uh, as Manuel is saying, they bring foreign food and tastes. The Filipino domestic workers in Italy are proud that they can make any sugo, uh, uh, Italian pasta sauce, uh, they can. And it's true about Filipino influence as well. I had a student from Singapore who wanted to do an honors thesis on Filipino domestic workers because she was brought up by a Filipino nanny in Singapore. So uh, I think, but there's also the blending, as she said, mestizo children so you do know that the last two miss universes that have, that are mestizo filipino of katrina gray is a filipino australian and uh, P- pia zurkback is filipino german so uh, uh, there is a lot of that um, uh, um, uh, blending That's and amazing. i think the migrants are becoming uh, very That's cosmopolitan yeah. they bought shawarma i think talking about food, yes. shawarma middle yes. east yeah Man- manuel would know more about that yeah, okay. yeah. but you, you mentioned uh, the international suffrage which is an, an interesting yes. segue and a useful segue to our or maybe our political uh, discussion now manuel um politics i suppose is the area that you you'd be most uh, comfortable in talking about as opposed to uh, cuisine and dance and literature uh, where mina might be the uh, the expert today um we mentioned in the introduction you know, the 1980 saw a significant democratic demographic shift uh, in the politics of the country um with the uh, removal of uh, president marcos in fact 36 weeks ago 36 years ago this week uh, the 22nd of february uh, the people took to the streets and 3 days later i believe marcos was gone so the shift was uh, uh, but in the in the 21st century there seems to have been a shift away from pluralistic national politics towards a more tempestuous political uh, scene, shall we call it, uh, with some might say um, a cult of personality uh, and, and a more tribal environment. So given your background, uh, how would you view the political landscape uh, in the country at the moment? Well, it's basically what happens when a country that had emerged 
from a dictatorship. So we were that particular thing, which is called the newly restored democracy, which means a messily assembled democracy, because it was the outcome of of a, a decade of of resistance and uh, and reactions uh, to President Marcos's rule. Now, in the three decades that has that have taken place since then, um, the the democracy that was born has proven itself curiously incapable of amending its own rules. You know, we all take it for granted in a in a constitutional system that one way for, for countries to sort of remain viable is to keep changing the rules of the game as required. The Philippines has gone through 36 years of having been unable to do that because of many reasons. Uh, we have a constitution that was written in a rush. We have institutions that enjoy low trust. We have um, a political class that has its own interests that are very different from public opinion and therefore cannot marshal the support to make the changes they want. Long and short of this, this has been a rejection of a pluralistic democracy and a slide back towards wanting a strong man to solve problems that the institutions are un unable to solve. You saw that with President Duterte, who was in many ways always considered a rather uh, amazing character, but not a mainstream character. And the story of how he went from literally being a curiosity to being a political phenomenon is one that took place with similar um, changes all over the world. Trump, Putin, um, you name it, and that was a a similarity. What do they have in common? They have in common the introduction of social media as a means to turn what, what, what used to be the lunatic fringe into a mainstream political force that the mainstream political players are incapable of confronting and competing against. And that's where we are now. So that 36 years after President Marcos was thrown out of the country, his son is now the leading contender to be elected president of the Philippines. It is both amazing and yet not surprising, considering what the whole world has gone through in terms of um, the crisis of modernity. <laughs> yeah. That, so are we back uh, you know, to uh, are we back yeah. to um, family dynasties and and clans and tribal, or or is it they, they never they never that? went away? It's the it's the organizing. Uh, it's, it's it's the way our society is organized on so many levels, not just political. There are dynasties of churchmen, of academics, of soldiers, even of diplomats and nurses. Uh, the problem is precisely that beyond that, we have been incapable of coming up with um, either a means to make political parties attractive and viable, or to work this out in a way that doesn't uh, perpetually slide back to being members of a cult for one family or another. Um, the, in the end, because of the, the many challenges of, of, of modernizing the country, I think a con the growing consensus was modernity is too difficult, it is too costly, and it is too risky. And therefore, there is a, a tendency to backslide to the comforts of, well, the families of the past are familiar, their promises are predictable, the way we engage with them and each other is also predictable, uh, which is in many ways rather sad. Yeah, I imagine uh, most of the audience here today will be particularly interested in President Duterte and his um, his successor. Uh, how, how do you think he'd be remembered in terms of the commitments he made, his achievements, uh, and the challenges he leaves behind for his successor? Well, he he he. I think he will. He is still going to be a political player, uh, not least because his daughter is the leading contender for vice president, and therefore a a, a front runner for the next presidential election this early on. Um, he represents a complete repudiation of, in many ways, the past century of Philippine history, um, of it being one that wanted to achieve the institutions and the liberties that the West takes for granted. Um, he, he represents, in many ways, an embrace of a mythical 
strongman past and of a very specific um, uh, repudiation of, of what you in the West will take for granted, a repudiation um, that is actively endorsed, let's say, in Beijing and in Moscow. So, um, which, of course, he has gravitated towards in his diplomacy as, as president of the Philippines. He, he embarked on a very, on, on the promise of liquidating drug addicts um, and therefore assuming, and for those of you who have studied the Third Reich, um, it is, he has incarnated the responsibility for these liquidations in himself, provided he is the acknowledged leader mm -hmm of the Filipinos, superseding all institutions. It's a dynamic we have seen before, um, and it, it, it shows you how it can be transplanted and flourish in uh, different societies. Yeah. How is he seen from a distance, uh, Mina? In Australia, would the Filipina does the, the diaspora ah. have strong views on Duterte, or would they be as mixed as they are back in the Philippines? Oh, there's a generational difference, which I found interesting. The The... Um, the parents of my Filipino students are very pro Duterte, and and my students are not, so they cannot discuss this topic in their family. It's not mm -hmm. just the Philippines. I have a Thai student who uh, cannot discuss the current Thai monarchy problem in her house because she, her parents love the king and she doesn't. So uh, I think it's not unusual uh, with what's happening in Southeast Asia and the migrants in Italy. They were very they're very pro Duterte. I think it's the idea that. They identify as marginal people. He's from in the now. He's not from the center. It's very attractive to them. Uh, and also a lot of uh, migrants come from in the now also, and they feel that uh, in a simplistic way that the Davao right. city is clean. And, you know, uh, and also someone's published an article in the Journal of Genocide arguing that because Duterte and his ilk um, uh, represent the, the ones that are killed as criminals and not really human, uh, then that kind of... <laughs> yeah. And I think that's what the migrants also imbibe from afar. So they're you over here. So. You mentioned that he's from Mindanao, uh, one of the southern islands. Uh, and uh, I've read that one of the uh, positives, if you could call it that, of his uh, reign was that um, decentralization and maybe um, move away from the centrality of Manila uh, um, in every sense it will be a lasting benefit. Would you subscribe to that view, Manuel? Will will decentralization? It, no. The, what was amazing was it was it was central to his political identity, and jettisoned with remarkable rapidity uh, wow. by the president himself. Eventually, he came out in public and said, "You know, now that I'm sitting here, it can't be done." And his economic team. Uh, took the lead in, in uh, and his economic team, by the way, is led by a, by a finance minister who is also from Mindanao, who said this, this is just unfeasible uh, given the fiscal uh, realities of the Philippines. Therefore, uh, it's interesting, though, that uh, Ferdinand Marcos Jr. is now running under a federal party, the Federalist Party. Therefore, the, the appeal is obviously still there. The reality... Um, was obviously quickly jettisoned, um, which leaves you wondering if um, perhaps the appeal in itself is also sort of over overblown. Um, yeah. the, the president was is is interesting also because um, it's under his term that that uh, essentially one city was was le le uh, leveled to the ground, uh, and yet and yet and yet. Um, the peace has has been maintained okay. so it's it's a mixed legacy um it is one that i think um is maintained more by a consensus in the region to maintain the peace malaysia which used to be very confrontational with the philippines has realized that it now it cannot afford uh, a problem in its in its back door so um, okay. i think it has proven to be an ally that way Okay, we we could go on for hours on the political scene alone. Uh, I suppose a very quick take from you uh, is Ferdinand Marcos Jr. likely to be the next Philippine president, Manuel? I think most yes, no? most people are probable, probable, and I hate to say that. Yeah. Okay, and from a distance, Mina, your uh, prediction? I don't. All I can say is that it would make me very sad because um, I we immigrated to Australia because my family was a victim of Marsh his. 
current uh, candidate's father, Ferdinand Marcos. Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, my dad's cousins owned the Manila Times, and he was a journalist like Manuel, okay. and and uh, and so. Um, <laughs> Well, let's just say we could the Philippines can surprise. Yeah. The yes, Philippines I was going to say. Surprise. But the Philippines can surprise you. So that's what's fascinating about the Philippines. You can't make any prediction. It will so, come up, I'm sure, know. again in the questions. And I see uh, quite a few already, which I hope to get to. Uh, so to allow time for that, I'm going to move it on. Um, uh, in the previous uh, of um, a closer look, we looked at Pakistan and the two excellent speakers on that webcast um, left two questions for you. Um, uh, one, uh, Saad Haran asked us, um, he'd like to know, how does the Philippines keep its beaches so clean? In, a, in, in 30 seconds, Manuel, how does it keep its beaches we so don't. clean? We don't. We don't. Because <laughs> part of them are being vacuumed away to create new islands for, for, for China. And the other is the plastic. We are one of the biggest plastic polluters in, on the planet. And it's really terrible. Okay. Um, well, I guess yeah. with 7,000 islands, you probably have a lot of beaches. But it sounds like you're uh, destroying some of them for for the, the island building that you mentioned. Uh, and the second mm -hmm. question from Yusra Asghari, uh, and maybe I'll put this one um, to both of you, uh, but again, quick answer. In a country like the Philippines, how important is people power when shaping direction for the future? Mina. Uh, well, I, th I, I think that Filipinos love to vote. I, if you compare the, the people who vote in the Philippines compared to a democracy like the US, uh, Filipinos want to have their voice heard. So I think Filipinos want to have their voice heard, and, and it's important. They like to dem some. They like to demonstrate in the streets, and so it, it's. I think it's very important. And now, of course, as Man Manuel saying, it's taken to social media. Okay. They just that's a yes. Away. So it's okay. yes, it's I'm going. Yes. I'm going to cut you because I want to get the questions in. Um, Manuel, quickly. Uh, people, uh, power we, people power as we knew it in 1986 went extinct in 2006. We are waiting to see what will take its place, precisely because of social media. Okay. And again, two quick questions for you and quick answers. Mina, what do you miss about life in the Philippines? Uh, social life. I don't have much of a social life here. Australians aren't, you know, that hospitable as Filipinos. So that one. And of course, the food uh, and support. So that one. Okay. Very good. Manuel, are you hopeful and positive about the future? For your fascinating yes, country? Yes, yeah, because if there's one thing we're supposedly like the British. We are great. <laughs> we we like we're able to scramble and craft a jerry rigged s solution to any problem. Eventually. Excellent. Well, that's a good, a positive way to end this part of our webcast. I'm going to move now to the questions because we have quite a few, and there are some excellent questions in there. The first one uh, says, "What are the positions of the presidential candidates on the South China Sea dispute with China?" The International Court of Justice has supported the Philippines' position, but Duterte preferred appeasing China. Uh, I guess, Manuel, that's probably one that you're best suited to okay. answer. Um, okay. In a nutshell, it's, it, it, it goes from uh, Ferdinand Marcos Jr.'s position, which is he will not relinquish the claim, but will not rock the boat. So that is the most accommodating to everyone else, which essentially slides to maintaining our alliance with the United States, maintaining the position of the of our claims but also finding a way to slowly strengthen and pursue most importantly a multilateral approach to the claims in the south china sea instead of what beijing wants which is a country to country approach okay i'll keep it moving quickly mina uh, you mentioned the continued brain drain from the philippines are there any measures or incentives in place that you're aware of to prevent and reverse the brain drain from the Philippines. As far as I know, no, because they want my they want migrants to leave because it it helps the economy, and it's easier apart from having more call centers and having and get and getting the Philippines uh, uh, jobs there. I'd say there isn't really because they want. They want migrants to, to go, they want people to get jobs overseas and send repentance. No, and our educational system has now become oriented to producing ah, yes, that's right. people to that's go abroad. Right. So it's really a lifestyle um, because it confers middle class status to people who were never middle that's class correct. in the first place. So right. so there's a proliferation of nursing schools, right? And there's a caregiving school and the seamen's maritime colleges for sea fairs because Filipino sea fairs are one third of the seafaring force in the world. So and they earn in U.S. dollars, so they have like 
definitions of the masculine, they're the ideal masculine because they're breadwinners and comes in US dollars. Uh, so these guys are the celebrities when they go back to the Philippines on holiday. So uh, Manuel's right. Thanks for bringing that up. The, the country yeah. itself is uh, uh, having is institutionalizing it so that they could continue to send these migrants. Okay. I think they're going to move to teachers next. They're going to send Filipino teachers right. to the U.S. and other and Australia and other places because there's a shortage of teachers. That's the next step. Okay, there is a, a very popular question, but I think we've probably answered it about um, regional strongmen, family dynasties. To what extent are they a defining factor in Philippine politics, uh, and has Duterte's rule changed the balance, Manuel? Um, no, I think it has tipped the balance precisely in um, in making them more entrenched. In um, there's there's going to be the a distinct possibility that in our Senate, which is nationally elected, we are going to have three sets of families with two members each. Uh, in a body that is 24 people. So it's making it even more entrenched precisely because um, people, uh, there is a, uh, there's an escape valve for everyone else to go abroad, which leaves the political families to rule the roost at home with increasingly less competition. Okay. And I could add a gender factor there. Uh, fr from the perspective of a woman, it's women are hardly, it's very hard for a woman to run for office, right? Uh, but she can through ties with a man. So political dynasties actually benefit women who can, like, because there's a, they try to limit family dynasties by having a constitutional term where you can only run three times for a congressman and twice for a senator of six years. If your term is up, what are you going to do? You're going to get your wife to run to keep well, the very, family dynasty going. Perfect introduction to the next question I see, which is um, how will the Philippines develop under Marcos Jr. and Sarah Duterte, a man and a woman and both from dynasties? Are there any re realistic alternatives? Manuel, back to you. Um, well, there is a the, the remnants of, of the old anti-Marcos opposition. And for the first time, the, the Democrats and the communists are actually sitting at the same table after 36 years of of, uh, of active hostility, we don't know. Um, so far, the the rules, the the, the odds are stacked against uh, the democratic uh, opposition. Um, but however, the Dutertes are a new dynasty. The Marcoses are an old one. Both have profound insecurities, and the question of uh, whether their their potential success will make them uh, forget the lessons of the past and want to sort of get even uh, without maintaining a, a kind of equilibrium with, with other new players. Um, that is the question that, that remains to be seen. Um, the, the Marcoses are showing not an authoritarian, but a populist streak right. this time yeah. around. And so that has profound mm -hmm. effects for the ability of, of people to do business with the Philippines and for the prospects of investments and even the kind of... Um, of economic climate we're going to have. We just liberalized uh, our, our economy again so that uh, more industries are now open to foreign investments at a time when a new government may be tempted to make uh, promises that are not conducive to, to confidence abroad. And, and the last uh, extension of that kind of um, question, uh, will the ultra-rich and the political dynasties ever allow a pluralistic democracy? Uh, to succeed in the Philippines? Yes, um, they will. Um, but so far, they are discovering that there are many ways, more ways around it. The, what, what is the sort of the saving strength, as Mina pointed out, is that we have a thoroughly ingrained culture of public opinion. And that opinion will find ways to express itself over and above any control of official or unofficial channels. Um, and that remains the catalyst for change. Even as the institutions themselves are proven weak, uh, mm. individuals are able to muster support on a case-for-case -case basis. And it's always a matter of when that one case is going to suddenly spark an epidemic of change uh, that makes things so interesting about the Philippines. Okay. Um, also, politi political dynasties don't stay forever. If you look at family rule over time, they rise and fall. You're, you're, you're in power, but it's ephemeral uh, over the long term. I mean, even the Marcuses were kicked out. They made a comeback, but they were kicked out. So there is a tension in the Philippines between supporting family mm. type of rule and the nationalist view that we, we don't want families that are corrupt. So we, but we, 
we have we have both these contradictory uh, things operating, and that's where you've got. Well, it's not uh, the only this. country in the world with contradictions. Uh, <laughs> I, say, I say that coming from a small island in the west of Europe that is full of contradictions. In fact, I see a lovely question here that links all of us. Um, uh, me being Irish, I use Filipino, and this event. Uh, put out by Asia Society Switzerland. I'll read it. Uh, question for Mina. Where can we find and take this identity uh, test? I don't I You can probably see it yourself. I am a um, Filipino, uh, grew up in Ireland, and now living in Switzerland, working for a Swiss NGO operating in the Philippines. Would love to connect. How, we, how may we contact you? Oh, well, you can you send can, me can, an email. Yes, okay. and I'll we, show you the book where I found the test. We, uh, yes. we see, we'll, we'll see if we can find it in the web. Okay. Uh, but there are all these questions, and they're all funny, especially if you're Filipino. Yeah. Irish. Oh, that's a very good combination because less cultural, the, the Catholicism in Ireland is similar to the Catholicism in, in the Philippines. So, uh, And my partner is British, so, so I can see the, 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 the cultural... What, what is that, Manuel? Did you what show is that? It's, a, it's, it's like a, a dipper. It's a dipper in every <laughs> Filipino will have it in their bathroom. And that's one of the things. There's a book called, you know, you're Filipino if dot, dot, dot. And one of those yes, is having one of these dippers okay. in your bathroom. Buy one. You can pretend you're Filipino even and, if you're not. Um, and that, that, that's, that's the one where all this comes from. There are a lot okay. of it. Do you, do, you, do you greet people with your eyebrows, you know? Well, to the, uh, <laughs> the that reminds me of the acronym you had earlier, obvious Filipino tendencies, OFT. Yes, you have a, obvious Filipino tendencies, OFT, and uh, do it. not resist. Well, look to uh, the person, futile. to the person who posed the question, I, I'm not going to call out your name, uh, where I'm uh, advised not to do so, but if you get in contact with Asian Society Switzerland, I'm sure they can put you in contact with Mina in terms of your uh, connection, uh, your question, and uh doing the identity test. Um, uh -huh. One or two last kind of semi-serious questions. Uh, well, they're not semi, they are serious. How, how strong is Filipino national identity in the smaller and remote islands, Manuel? Very quickly, so we get time to get a few more in. Quite, quite strong and probably stronger than ever because of pop culture, because of music, uh -huh. because of television, because of radio. Okay. And, because uh, Tagalog is taught to schools everywhere now, so there's now a common language. In the past, before the Filipino became, uh, you know, the 1920s, migrants couldn't speak to each other because different islands yeah. had different times. But now Tagalog okay. and as Ma Manuel says, popular culture unites. Hence the okay. Filipino test. <laughs> okay. Two very quick questions, and then I, I'm going to do the closing questions. Uh, is future peace possible in Mindanao? And is Maria Ressa, the journalist, safe? Either of you. The peace, oh, the peace, I think, is 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 actually there's a there's a there's a commitment, there's there's a consensus, and it's a consensus that stretches to our neighbors. So I think it is the most positive point. Um, a new government was created, and it has been extended in its term, and seems to be getting its bearing. So um, there's that. Maria Ressa, um, you know, uh, she herself, I think, is is systematically harassed. But I think she will be physically safe. But she is actually the the voice representing a whole industry and a whole profession uh, okay. that is uh, having well, a tough. Well, you as a journalist yourself, I'm sure, will be very uh, closely watching that. I, I'm going to close the Q and A session because uh, I, I have a couple of quick questions to close the webcast as a whole. Thanks to those who put questions in, and for those one or two that I didn't get to, I'm really sorry. An hour isn't uh, enough time at all. Um, two quick questions, and they're not frivolous. Uh, I think those of us on this uh, who would love to see the Philippines in more, uh, in, to a greater extent, um, these would be uh, interesting observations from you. So, Mina, um, your favorite place and meal in the Philippines, or indeed oh. Philippine restaurant if it's not in the Philippines. But anyway, well, favorite I, place I, and meal. I, I'm going to reveal my, you know, low class. Uh, uh, I, I, I miss rice cake with duck eggs. So I go to Via Mare to have the rice cake with the duck egg and a freshly gated coconut, which you can never get in Australia or anywhere else. So uh, okay. it's very mundane, but. Rice, what did you say? Rice cakes, was it? Rice. Rice. rice cakes with salted duck's egg okay. and cheese with great freshly grated coconut. I hope this is recorded and we can uh, circulate that <laughs> recipe to, to everyone who is on. Manuel, your yeah. favorite place and meal in the Philippines, and you're, of course, living there. Well, um, there's a place beside Manila Bay called Harbor View, and they have 
you know, the glory of Philippine seafood. It's a wonderful place. If you ever come to Manila, that should be the first place you eat because you get to enjoy the bay and our seafood. Excellent. Thank you. I'm mindful of time. Uh, we'd always close these A Closer Look At webcasts with questions from you to the panelists of the next uh, webcast, which is in two weeks' time on A Closer Look on the uh, country of Kyrgyzstan, a place I have never been and I, I suspect most of us would struggle to find on a map uh, and much smaller, of course, in every sense to the Philippines. So if you wanted to leave two questions, one each, for the panelists uh, on the Kyrgyzstan webinar, what might they be? Well, Mina. mine is. Uh, Manuel, oh, ahead. sorry, sorry, sorry. Okay, mine is. Sorry. Mine is. Um, we Filipinos love shawarma because of our exposure to the Middle East, and it's a part of the shared heritage that the Kyrgyzstani people have too. So, how are the new generations uh, maintaining their culture in the face of the expansion of of uh, Russian chauvinism and the Western uh, efforts to modernize everything? That's my okay. Question. Uh, well, we'll pose that to them in two weeks' time. Uh, Simona, who I think will moderate that, uh, is on today, so she will put to the panel uh, that question. Mina, anything you'd like to ask the Kyrgyzstan um, panelists? Just a, a simple one, because I'm a dress historian. Uh, what What is the national dress for men and women, and is it something they wear every day, or just for ceremonial occasions, or re I, or religious? Uh, I know Very that they have nice head coverings. Uh, uh, is it different for men and women? So that's all. Excellent question. And, well, and I will answer the question of Colleen Cardeno. Is it called Bibinka? Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, look, yes. I've run a couple of minutes over, but it was fascinating. And I would be happy to talk to you both for another hour, as I'm sure many of the audience will be. And, and in fact, most of them are still on, as I see on my screen here. But we're going to have to close it there. I've learned so much about your marvelous country. Uh, it would be the most populous country in Europe if it could be relocated here. Mm -hmm. So it's an important country. And I hope that those on today have learned a lot more about it uh, and that this series is uh, actually elevating awareness about uh, Asian countries here in Europe and pretty Asian society members. So I want to thank you both, uh, Mina thank and you. Manuel, for your thank time, you. your My uh, pleasure. astute and witty observations, and everyone who joined the audience today. So thank you, uh, thank and you. have a good day. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.